The year is 1066 and Duke William of Normandy, fresh from his bloody victory over the Anglo-Saxons under King Harold Godwinson, awaits forlorn messages of submission from the surviving nobles. Instead, he is greeted with heartfelt appeals from the women of the slain, mothers, sisters and daughters seeking to recover the remains of their fallen men. Among them is an appeal from Gaifa, the mother of King Harold himself. Gaifa offers the victor her son's weight in gold for the body, yet the usually avaricious William refuses, fearing the body may become a nexus for a Saxon cult or worse. Yet William may have come to regret his decision, as this formidable lady now bent her fort on revenge and rebellion. Immediately following the battle, William secured his throne by a swift campaign around London and the southeast, crowned king on December 25th of 1066. In the years immediately following this, castles began scarring the landscape as the victorious foreigners dug in. Such structures were simply an alien imposition for the native English. Fortifications, of course, had been common, yet always built and maintained for the defence and benefit of the people. The famed burrs of King Alfred's time and others were defensive structures and economic magnifiers. Norman castles were anything but, likely largely built through the unhappy sweat and toil of coerced Anglo-Saxon natives as depicted in the bio-tapestry. The castle was an instrument of oppression built to dominate an area, ultimately enabling at most a few tens of thousands of Normans to control an English population numbering around two million. Orderic Vitalis writes that, quote, Bishop Odo and Earl William were left behind here in 1067, and they built castles far and wide throughout the land, oppressing the unhappy people, and things went ever from bad to worse. When God wills, may the end be good. Unsurprisingly then, several local uprisings erupted in 1067 against such castle building, for example, Herefordshire Fane, Adric the Wild, fought back with some success, causing significant Norman losses, and even joined forces with two Welsh princes to raid the province. The people of Dover, too, invited Count Eustace of Boulogne to assist them in seizing the castle there, a pact that may have particularly vexed King William, given the latter's status as an invader. Eustace was certainly no random middling thug, either, he is credited by the Carmen as one of the knights tasked finishing off King Harold at Hastings a few months before, even striking the first blow, and had been married to King Edward the Confessor's sister, Godgifu. On the surface, as a companion of the Conqueror, we could construe Eustace's act as strange, yet the relationship between Eustace and William was actually much more checkered. Eustace had joined the rebellion against William in 1053 that had directly threatened him and had been forced to surrender his son as a hostage when it had failed. At some point in 1067, the two men had fallen out again and so Eustace assembled some men and invaded to assist the Kentish rebels seeking to take Dover Castle. Unfortunately for him and his English allies, the Norman garrison struck out in a sortie, driving them back with Eustace skulking back to Boulogne in failure. The city of Exeter became the focal point of another rising in 1068. Having heard rumours of a plot to massacre Norman garrisons across the kingdom around Ash Wednesday, King William returned to England by Christmas of 1067 and had, beforehand, sent knights to the city who were given a decidedly frosty welcome. Exeter's intentions were confirmed when its leading citizens began sending messages to other cities, urging an uprising, messages intercepted by the king. William responded by sending his own demand that Exeter's citizens swear fealty to him. The Norman sources for the incident remain silent on the identity of the leadership, yet our English sources inform us that the ringleaders of this trouble were in fact the surviving members of the defeated King Harold's family, 
specifically his elderly mother, Guyfer. Guyfer had as much reason as anybody in England to hate William, having been refused her son's mutilated body following Hastings. She had also lost three other sons in Gurf, Leofwine, and also Tostig a year before. What's more, her youngest son, Wolfnoff, was still William's prisoner, having been forcibly taken to Normandy by Robert of Jumierge in 1052. Her sons may have been killed or imprisoned, but King Harold had had sons from his first marriage to Edith Swanneck, a rich noblewoman from the East Anglian region. Incidentally, it had been Edith who, legend tells, had been summoned to identify King Harold's mutilated corpse by distinguishing certain marks on his body, known only by her. Harold had three sons who were probably in their late teens or early twenties, and had fled west to Ireland following Hastings. Certainly then, the Godwins were not quite finished with Guyfer, the family matriarch, and her grandsons, plotting a comeback. This plan was perhaps not as insane as it sounds on first hearing. Guyfer had Danish blood flowing through her veins, and was related to the Danish royal line, as well as being the mother not just of King Harold, but also King Edward the Confessor's queen, Edith. Guyfer then was a highly connected, motivated lady, fully capable of disrupting William's plans for a continued reign. Given her Danish heritage, it's also known that Guyfer probably sent envoys to Denmark for support, and even a possible invasion. That, with her own fifth column in Exeter, and her grandson's expected invasion from Ireland, may have just been enough. Of course, ultimately, this just wasn't to be. King William, having had his demand for fealty refused, immediately raised a new army which included both Norman and English subjects. Indeed, the oaths of fealty received immediately following Hastings and his campaign in the southeast would now be tested. However, before the royal army even reached the city, a delegation of leading men rode out to him, seeking peace and pledged to open the city's gates to him, even handing over hostages to this effect. Bizarrely, however, according to Orderic Vitalis, they then returned to their city only to continue preparations to resist a siege. One reasonable explanation for this mixed response to William's march is the divided motivations of the rebels. Guyfer and her supporters obviously had solid reasons for their defiance and wanted to see William toppled, yet many malcontents probably just sought better treatment from the conqueror given a heavy tax had recently been demanded, though it's clear that they were willing to pay a lighter levy, according to Orderic Vitalis. Arriving at Exeter, William found the gates shut against him. To induce surrender, he blinded a hostage, full view of the walls, yet to no effect. Well, not exactly no effect. According to William of Malmesbury, a haughty defender responded to this act of brutality, by bearing his arse and farting loudly in King William's general direction. The siege thus began and lasted for 18 days. The royal army suffered significant losses, though given William ordered several attempted stormings of the city, it's likely these were sustained by his native feared infantry who had joined his several hundred knights in his march west. Despite some fanciful depictions in the Bayer Tapestry of mounted knights attacking fortifications unsupported, this, in practice, would have resulted in high Norman casualties that the vastly outnumbered king could scarcely afford. These attacks failed, yet victory was still inevitable. Inside the city, the Warhawks likely prodded the defenders into increasingly desperate fighting very likely largely against their fellow Englishmen of William's feared. However, a peace faction certainly existed and began to gain the upper hand. In addition to the more direct assaults, the men of the royal army were also undermining the walls themselves. Indeed, the Normans were no stranger to siege warfare, least of all King William. William had besieged a rival claimant to his duchy after his victory at the Battle of Valedun in 1047 for three years and was well versed in siegecraft. William of Poitiers, one of our chief sources on the time, has it that the city was forced into surrender because of the sheer ferocity of William's assaults. Yet William of Malmesbury informs us that the Norman besiegers gained entry to Exeter 
following the collapse of part of the walls. Interestingly though, the breach appeared not due to the efforts of William's besiegers, but through divine intervention, Jericho style. In contrast, a more tedious conclusion, according to English sources, is that the city surrendered following the desertion of the die-hard Godwin faction. Guifer, according to John of Worcester, fled with many supporters from Exeter, thus leaving the more moderate rebels free to negotiate a surrender with King William. Although Guifer had been thwarted in using Exeter as a nexus of rebellion against her son, King Harold's nemesis, the remaining citizens did escape relatively unscathed. According to Alderic Patalis and William of Poitiers, the king seized no goods and even guarded the city's gates to prevent plundering. A more realistic Anglo-Saxon chronicle states William, quote, made fair promises to the citizens, fulfilled them badly. Whatever the exact details, Exeter's surrender was negotiated and not forced with the Doomsday Book later attesting that the citizens at least gained a major concession. They paid the same tax as before the conquest, although another castle predictably became a permanent feature of the local skyline. Guifa herself did escape the fall of the city, sailing into the Bristol Channel, finding refuge on the Isle of Flatholm. Perhaps there she hoped for a reunion with the forces of her grandsons from Ireland, yet no counter-attack occurred. Ultimately, this formidable Anglo-Saxon matriarch sailed into permanent exile in Flanders. William, meanwhile, led his army west into Cornwall, putting down further sporadic resistance before establishing a follower, Brian of Brittany, as Earl of Cornwall, and disbanding his Anglo-Norman army. Following this, he celebrated Easter within the walls of the ancient capital of Wessex itself, Winchester. Yet 1068 was far from the end of the newly minted King William's Troubles. But for those stories, you'll have to remain tuned to Bert's Battles. Share, subscribe and smash that bell button for those. And we shall see you next time.